to season three of Unapologetically Woman. We're celebrating phenomenal women all across Kentucky who make no apologies for their perspectives or the impacts that they're making in the community. Today, we're celebrating Kimberly Baird. Kim is a wife, a mom, a grandma, and she's a Fayette Commonwealth's attorney. Unapologetically woman, Kimberly Baird, that's you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very much an honor. Well, we're glad to have you. So you've been in there in the seat for a little bit. How's <sighs> it going? Oh, my. <laughs> There is no there is no job description for this at all. And so it's definitely different than what I expected. Um, there are times that it's definitely more fulfilling than what I expected. And then there are times when I'm like, ooh, I really want to do this, do I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you but and you're doing it and you're making history doing it. I am you're the first history. black woman. I am. How do you feel about that? It is um it's a lot. And so I didn't even think about it really when, um, when, you know, when the governor called, it was really more of my predecessor is leaving. We need continuity of the office, you know, and so it, that was really kind of my focus early on. And so then when it was, when it hit, oh, you are actually the first African-American person in Fayette County and the first black woman in Kentucky, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I would never have guessed that. And I've always been big on mentoring you know, bringing young ones up behind you. And so all of the messages that I got, people still seeing me out. Oh, I saw you on TV. The the impact that I feel like I'm, I hope I have and will continue to have on people growing up and seeing someone that looks like them, um, you know, going forward is just, it's amazing. Well, you know, we always talk about representation matters. Yes. You know, and it really, and it really does because even in Fayette County, you know, there was a little bit of a shift yeah. um, in the way that, that things have been going. Yes, very much so. And it's, um, I have to tell people all the time, when I first started as a prosecutor and I would get, you know, people saying, you know, well, how can you prosecute your own people? So what I wanted to say was first, <laughs> don't assume that our people don't commit crimes, but the main part to that being, if you have an issue with the office, then you need to be at the table to make sure whatever issues are resolved or there's a perspective that's there. And so, you know, a lot of people don't want to be a prosecutor because they have this other thought, you know, they want to be a defense attorney, which is what I wanted to be. But if you have an issue with, you know, with the way the system is, then get in there and use your voice to make sure that the system is regulated. To do in the way something it's about it. That's exactly right. Well, listen, that's what you thought you wanted to be a prosecutor too. Um, did I say that right? A defense attorney. Oh. So you thought you wanted to be a defense attorney, yes. too, but you also thought that you would be in the U.S. Supreme Court. 100%. <laughs> that was what so I that thought. that was your dream? That was my dream. I went to D.C. with my mother when I was um, probably a young teenager, loved the city. And so growing up, I was going to be a defense attorney because I was going to, you know, defend those who were in the system because my view of prosecutors came from law and order, you know, what you saw on TV, which was not portrayed well. And so I was going to go to D.C. I went, graduated high school, was getting the applications for D.C. And my mom said, well, you've never really been away from home. Why don't you go to U.K. and then transfer? Well, four years later, I graduated from U.K. <laughs> so mm -hmm. then I'm getting the law school applications for D.C., Virginia area. And um, they don't really tell you the financial aid package. I didn't know anybody up there. I was like, well, let me not just zip up there and not have a plan. Right. I'll transfer. Well, three years later, I graduate from UK Law. So <laughs> I never, the only other time I made it up there after that, when I was a teenager, was my daughter's like fifth grade class trip. So I've never been back up there. And so again, I thought I was going to still thinking be a defense attorney, but here. And then I went to law school and um, thought about family law. Um, and then I sat in a hearing and it did not go well <laughs> when I was watching mm -hmm. it. And I was like, yeah, I can't be arguing mm -hmm. with these people all day long. So um, my my, my first boss, Ray Larson, was at the law school, mm -hmm. and that's when I um, introduced myself. I worked at the Urban League, so I'd have to pass the office, and he would see me, and I was like, you don't know who I am. So I walked up to him and just introduced myself, and he said, take my internship class. I was like, oh, absolutely not. And so we argued in the law school. <laughs> and did and you take the class? I, last minute, I changed my schedule and took the class, and mm -hmm. I started in January of 96, and had been there ever since. And it was not at all what I expected. You know, the people do well and want to do well. They want to make a change. You know, as a prosecutor, you you have an awesome responsibility because under the law, you have to protect the rights of the defendants, regardless. You have to. Mm -hmm. You also have to protect the rights of victims, and then you have to protect the rights of citizens to be safe. 
So it is a tremendous responsibility that most people don't know. So we're not, you know, trying to throw people in jail. People say, oh, you know, that I think I get some special thing if I convict people. And I was like, no, that doesn't help anybody. That you don't get a bonus? <laughs> I don't get a bonus for that. And I've got too much work to do, but just getting random innocent people, mm-hmm. you know, and, and doing that. And so, um, so my boss, when I didn't immediately say yes at the job offer, because it was still odd to me, and that's when he said, as a defense attorney, you get to protect the rights of defendants one person at a time, those persons that you are representing. As a prosecutor, under the law, you are required to protect everybody's rights, and you set the standard in this office about how we treat people. I was like, well, okay. That's I'm big. in. <laughs> I'm That's in. Big. Yeah, so I've been there ever since. So, again, I, it's still not thinking that I was going to be the Commonwealth's attorney. Never at all did I think that. So, but I'm Well, here. when I saw the news flash, I was like, oh my God, that's <laughs> Kim. It's my board member. <laughs> yes. Yay! Yes. Yeah, you cheered me on. I got so many text messages and emails and phone calls. It was over it was overwhelming. You know, sort of like, oh, people really do like me, you know. Yeah, <laughs> we're, and, that, and we're yeah. proud yeah. and excited and all of those things, yes. Kim. I'm glad. Thank you. And that keeps me going because it is it's it's hard. It is so hard. But when people say encouraging things, it definitely keeps me going. And even before I was in this job as a prosecutor, you get, you know, victims that are upset just because you're experiencing them in the worst time of their lives. And they want to get to the the defendant. and They can't. They want to get to the judge and they can't. So they've got you as the screaming bag. Mm -hmm. You've got, you know, defense attorneys who think you're being too harsh and judges who just kind of, you know, are working on the defendant and really not paying much attention to anything else. And um, and so you just you get it from all sides and really don't get a thank you or, you know, and so you threaten to quit on a regular basis <laughs> and then you'll get, you know, some victim that, you know, out of the blue just says, hey, I was thinking about you. Thank you for what you did. Or Absolutely. even defendants have stopped me in the store. I've learned what this means. You don't remember me, do you? And then they want to tell me, you told me, you know, you gave me a chance and said, don't come back. So they're introducing me to their family and telling me how well they've done. So I feel like I'm making a difference on both sides, which is really what I wanted to do. And see, that's incredible. Yeah. But even when you're making a difference, you are so busy. You're on the board at Community Action Council, yes. but you are also involved in Jack and Jill. Yes. Tell us about that. I love Jack and Jill. I didn't know what it was, you know, when I when it started back. We were chartered back in 2008, and uh, my daughter was uh, five at the time. And it has it was a great opportunity for her. So it got her around other people who look like her, who are like-minded like her, parents who have the same values of her as, as she is. And it, and it forced her to, she's very introverted, so it's forced her to talk and to be, mm-hmm. you know, out and about. So she loves it. So now, you know, she's now graduated. She's a sophomore, sorry, a junior now at Transy. Mm-hmm. And um, so now I'm a, what's called an associate, a retiree is what I call myself. So we, we're there to support, you know, the active members. We still attend you know, meetings if we want to or events and things like that, but we're there as support. So it's been a great opportunity for her. Okay, so you mentioned your daughter. Uh-huh. Who's your favorite? Your daughter, do- your your children or your grandchildren? Favorite. <laughs> you know they're watching this. <laughs> <laughs> so I I have one daughter, um Micaiah Mik- is a is a tr- uh she's a junior at Transy. A true attorney. Go ahead. She is spoiled beyond belief by Mm -hmm. her daddy, of course. Um, And then I have a stepson that's older, and then he has two daughters. So the two granddaughters really kind of grew up with Micaiah's sisters, really, because they're similar in age. And so... Okay, my you two love everybody. I love them all. How about that? You are I'm not, not going to get me in trouble today. Mm-hmm. My no. mom would say, "No, I love the grandkids. That's that's who I love the most." I well, see, I can't say that because Makai is at my house right now. Oh. So if she, if I go in and tell her that she'll look at me sideways. So I can't. Mm, but well, no. let's, well, let's not tell her that. That's right. <laughs> let's not tell her that. No, but you're but also no. um, a board member of Children's Advocacy of the Bluegrass. Mm-hmm. Yes. So one of the jobs that I had before I became Commonwealth Attorney and still do is prosecuting those cases um, with our vulnerable children. So the child physical and sexual abuse cases at the Children's Advocacy Center. So I run the multidisciplinary team meetings where we talk about that and collaborate with law enforcement and the advocacy center. But then also as my position as Fayette Commonwealth attorney, I'm on the board as well. So, you know, just kind of working to that facility. You know, I hate 
that there's a need for that because that means I was just about being, to ask mm -hmm. you about that. Yeah. How do you, how do you handle that personally? You know, working. <sighs> It is hard. I want to kill some people sometimes, <laughs> and then, you know, but it is very hard when you see these babies and you know that their lives are forever changed because of what some perpetrator has done to them. And so the Advocacy Center, like I said, I hate that there's a facility for that because that means these babies are being abused. Exactly. But this Advocacy Center and the ones throughout the state, our Children's Advocacy Center is fantastic. So it's got kind of a one-stop shop so they can come in, they're interviewed by the detectives or interviewed by the forensic interviewers with the detectives. There's a medical facility in there, there's counseling services. So anything that we can try to do for those babies, whether there's a case or not, to try to just, you know, heal them and help them, you know, so that their, their trajectory doesn't, you know, go too far off course. Well, I would think that that would be difficult. It's very difficult. And so when you're not doing all of your legal stuff and things that intertwine, you're also the chair of the Roots and Heritage <laughs> Festival. That's a big one. Yes, I'm the, I keep saying I'm the interim chair. When I took this job, I said I'm going to do it temporarily because we had to do a quick switch. And how many years is temporary? Uh, it's been like 18 years. Mm -hmm. And I need somebody to take this from me. <laughs> You know, it was it was definitely a labor of love for all of the people who started this festival back in 1989. And sort of like when your mom's involved, it means you involved. That's right. So my mother was the vendor coordinator back when it started. And so I was helping her. So then as we kind of came up and I kind of started working more with the vendors and she helped me. So then I ended up being on the board, ended up having to be the chair. We had to, like I said, do a quick change real fast. And so I said, I'll do this temporarily and temporary won't go away. And everybody says, but you're doing such a great job. I was like, well, I can mess it up if you want me to. <laughs> but, I can stop this real quick. Exactly, to come out of that. And so, but what I want people to know is it is a volunteer job. And so, you know, you'll hear a lot of things, you know, people talking about the festival and, you know, do you get paid? Absolutely not. There's, that's not. In order to maintain this festival is free. Every event that we have is free. It is run by volunteers, you know, and everything People that we do. People giving of themselves. Give, I mean, and a lot of time. I mean, I, my end of August and September is just don't schedule anything. Because mm -hmm. it's board meetings and, you know, scheduling and getting contracts signed and getting money and getting sponsors and dealing with the vendors and things like that. So if anybody ever wants to help, please. If anybody has a labor of love and wants to be the chair, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I've yes. got to think that you started doing this for some reason. My mother has always been big into volunteering, so I always grew up giving back to the community, always. So that's why. Yeah, I, right? I mean, <laughs> it, yes, yes, you know, I can't even, you know, Wilderness Road Girl Scout Council, mm -hmm. Junior League of Lexington, uh, yes. Usher at the Church, yes. on and on, and Sigma Gamma Row, yes. you know, it's, it's just yes. on and on, it just... Never yes. stops. Blame my mother for that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, no, she always volunteered. She always worked in the community, you know, helping out. And so that meant I was as well. So that's where that was instilled in me. Um, so that's why I do it, because I think that there's a responsibility that I have to give back to the community in which I live and serve. And so that was the emphasis also I put on my, uh, my office. And I always have them go out and go into the community so that you just know who you're around. And being born and raised here, you know. So she influenced you a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you think she feels about you being in the position that you're in right now? Oh, she's grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> when I grew up, I would, you know, it was always, oh, you're Beverly's daughter. And so now she says, now it's like, oh, you're Kim's mom. Uh -huh. And then, and so they think, oh, you look so young and you're too young to be her daughter, you know, her mother. And oh, she is eating it up. <laughs> she loves Proud it. Proud as she can be. Oh, and absolutely. she should be. Absolutely. She should be. Yeah. So she's, she grins a lot. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you, Kim? <sighs> In what capacity? <laughs> <laughs> In any capacity, because you could be volunteering somewhere. You could be uh, just anywhere. You could be on the Supreme Court. You could Ooh. be somewhere. <laughs> I could. I am. I haven't even been in this job for a year. And there's a lot of things that I want to do still in this role. So one of them being just to um, we have a lot of old souls in my office and then we have a young a lot of young ones. 
And so we just kind of go through memory. And so I'm wanting to be able to document everything that we do in our office so that anybody coming in in any position will know exactly what we do, why we do it, so that we're consistent in how we operate. Mm -hmm. So I definitely don't want it to be a situation of you get something done differently based on who the prosecutor is. Um, you know, I don't want that. So that we're going to be consistent across the board. The other thing I want to do is being more in the community and educating the community. Because people do not know who the Fayette Commonwealth Attorney is or what their job is and what our difference is between the county attorney. I get called Angela. Angela gets called me. <laughs> people don't know when you get arrested. It all starts in the, the county attorney's okay, office let's and tell comes them what to the me. Difference is right now. The Fayette County Attorney's <laughs> Office, which is Angela Evans, handles all the misdemeanor offenses. So 12 months or less, that's her office. She handles the majority of the juvenile cases. She handles mental health court and those types of things. And she handles mainly the child support issues up front. I'm the Commonwealth attorney, and so if there's an arrest and then it's a felony where you're going to get one year or more all the way up to the death penalty, they can send those up to my office. So we handle all the rapes, the robberies, the murders, those types of cases, and we will handle juveniles if they fit certain criteria. Mainly the juveniles we get are if they charge with, like, robbery, murder, or serious assault. So we don't get all of them. We just get those kind of main ones. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's a lot. Office. Yes. That's a lot. Yeah. So... I'm going to kick it to you. Uh-oh. <laughs> yes, I'm going to kick it to you. Um, give you the last word for young girls, young women who might be watching that is, that's looking up to you. Because people often look at people and don't realize the journey that yes. took place before yep. what you're seeing right now. Yes. What kind of advice would you give them? I would say um, you can be anything you want to be and you can do anything that you want to do. And do your best and be the best because you never know who's watching you. So um, I, again, did not want, know I wanted to be a prosecutor until I got in the office and saw what it was about. And I did not have anybody really as a role model female black prosecutor to look up to. I was the first in my office when I came, first female in the office when I came. And so I just had to, you know, learning what I learned, I want to bring other people up and to put them in the office with me. So again, people still have a little bit of this resistance to prosecution and I have to tell them that. But it isn't just necessarily prosecution. It is anything. Like some of my very wonderful friends are judges and heads of things and, you know, chiefs of staff and, you know, all <laughs> kinds of things who started out in my office and, you know, are going on to do great things. And so know your worth and, you know, know that you can do anything you put your mind to. Find somebody, you know, that you want to look up to and get advice from and follow that advice, you know, and then chart whatever path that you want. So proud of you, Kim. Thank you. Congratulations Thank again. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to be here. Definitely feel very honored to be amongst the many women that you all have highlighted here. Very proud. Well, you certainly deserve to be there, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> you guys continue to watch as we celebrate other phenomenal women just like Kim who are making changes in the community. You keep watching, and I'll see you soon.